Welcome to PLZ Soccer's football podcast. I'm Peter Martin. Delighted to have your company again, not only in audio forum with Spotify, Libsyn, Deezer and Apple, but of course, uh, great to have so many people joining us and watching on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. In the studio, Alan Ruff, Tam Cowan, as ever with me. And our special guest this week is none other than Tommy Sheridan. Should we do this, Tam, before we even start asking him things? <laughs> go for it, go for it. <laughs> He's looking, he's looking the Tommy of all that sat. I mean, the rain's been scudding down for about three months now, but look at him. He's like sitting with Halle Berry. <laughs> <laughs> he's a bit like, you, you wish, Tom. He's a bit like Ruffy. He always looks, he always looks great, even in the middle of the oh, winter, Ruffy. Of course he does. I mean, he looks after himself. He's very, very healthy. Takes all the Absolutely. stuff. Yeah. That's what happens. And you're healthy, you were telling us as well. Yes, yes, right? yes. I've had a test for this uh, coronavirus yep. and uh, I'm okay. Well, right, there you go. Uh, if uh, none of us uh, survive, at least we'll know when you've dated the programme, Ruffy, so that's quite good. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Apart from anything else, uh, there's lots to talk about. Of they course. check you for all the other viruses, <laughs> eh? No, I had to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> uh, we are a football podcast, though you'd never know it half the time when we have a banter uh, about other things, but... Tommy, there's so much to chat to you about. Of course, the other thing uh, that not a lot of uh, people will know, but we know because we play football with you, is uh, you were a fair footballer in your day. Did you have dreams of running out there in your favourite team's colours? Who didn't he? Um, who didn't he? Peter, growing up in working class background in Glasgow, um, playing football for uh, a young age, um, wanted to be a footballer. That's, that's what I wanted to be, unfortunately. I was uh, a yard too slow. Um, and uh, I never quite made the grade. Uh, but I've enjoyed playing football all my life. Um, my old man used to take us to uh, all the Celtic games for, I was a, a kid, but then when I got to about 10, 11, and we started playing more regularly, then I couldn't go to as many games. And then I feel rotten a wee bit about this because my, my dad then <laughs> getting broiled and helping to run the football team, Pollock United, um, but I was brought up in Pollock in the south side of Glasgow, and uh, he ended up, um, no going to the games either, and his brother, Monko Jim, same thing, and uh, they end up taking the team, which is one way of guaranteeing a game, of course. Yep. Uh, as long as I helped him with the strips on a Friday night, I got selected the next day. He used to keep a wee book where he would write the team out on a Friday night, and I was always sneaking to make sure my name was at. Um, but in those days, it was uh, fantastic. Just absolutely love playing football. With some notable um, players in our day, with David McPherson <coughs> played with our team, with Billy Davis play with our team, and in our older age group with Tommy Coyne playing um, with Paul United. So we're a, we're a football club, a boys club that uh, had a fair amount of success. And it was more than a football team. It was like a wee social club as well because we trained two nights a week. We used to have discos on a Friday night and it kept a lot of young lads in Pollock off the streets and yeah. probably uh, prevented a lot of young boys getting into uh, trouble where uh, we had a lot of gang wars and glue was getting sniffed in the days, stabbings and, and the like. So yeah. uh, managing to avoid that was quite uh, good as well. But I always wanted to be a footballer. Growing up with, with we Billy and my, my mate Monty, um, we tried to um, keep ourselves fit. We avoided the smoking, we avoided the drinking. Um, and we thought we were going to be footballers. Unfortunately, one out of three has did it. Yeah. But uh, there you go. That's, that's that's your Donald. But you know the funny thing about it, Ruffy, that you'll uh, be able to um, relate to this. <coughs> Tam is one of those guys of a generation, um, Tam, where it didn't matter where the game was. Uh, if I called him or you chapped his door and said, "By the way, we've got a g we've got a game around the corner, <laughs> or we've got a game twenty mile away," I'm in. Yeah, I'm but, going. But we go back to the we go back to the days when you played. If it was a Saturday, if, if you could bang three games in, you would get three games in. Oh, You'd get a game in the morning, one maybe at twelve o'clock, and then try and stick another one in at three. And that's the problem with Scottish football. There's not enough kids playing enough football. And see the amount of times I think big games because live games were so rare when I was growing up. You would get impromptu games of football would break out depending on what had happened. Goals that I can think of. Ray Wilkins doing some magnificent mm. chip for the edge of the box. Maybe an FA Cup final replay. You remember that yep, goal? that was against uh, Brighton. We, the boys instinctively, we didn't even coast in their phones to phone each other. It was barely lemmed in the street of the landline. But he instinctively grabbed a ball and went up the bit we called it the telegraph pole, which a lovely bit of flat grass, which of course indeed did have a telegraph pole there. The other one, the night that uh, uh, Villa, Ricardo Villa, got that mazy run for Spurs. We instinctively as well all ran up the park uh, to play football. When Paul, all the memories are flooding back here, when Paul Rideout, 
that a young Paul Ride outscored that raker in the schoolboy game, mind Scotland, England. 5-4. Five, 5-4, four. Five, four. there you go, you're doing very well. <laughs> we instinctively, you want it to go up because you want it to try big uh, shots for long distance. Yeah. And that, that's what it was all about growing up. You absolutely loved the football. And then the other great, Peter, you'll be aware of this as a fellow Lanarkshire lad, uh, it was always funny when you look back now that uh, when you went to play football on a Sunday with all your pals, the Sunday was the day that you often had to play miles away from where you normally played, <laughs> so uh, your weak Catholic pals wouldn't get caught dog in the mass. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> Suddenly you, you just played at the top of your street, but on a Sunday when they were wanting to juke out to go into the chapel, uh, come on, we'll just play down in Torquay the night. <laughs> I need but people, but people wouldn't people wouldn't believe you that they Sunday games you used to you used to go with your mates. We used to go to Drum Chapel to St Pius and it used to be twenty two a side. Aye. Aye. Twenty two a side and some people couldn't get a game. Yeah. Aye. You needed a good first touch trophy. Yeah. <laughs> or the ball. <laughs> or you need to own the ball. Tam I mean he has just gone through Tam's just gone through um, you know, three or four iconic moments. Is there is there moments that stick in your mind, you know, from and it wasn't telly wasn't on football wasn't on regularly. Well, because I was coming on the the show, Peter, and and um, recently I was thinking about games that stuck in my mind and one of the games was probably the biggest and most important game in my life because it was eight years of age when I was at it and it was uh, the, the 72 Scottish Cup final which uh, involved a lot of my favourites as far as football is concerned because Dixie Dean scored the hat-trick that day yeah. um, we beat Hibs um, 6-1 um, it was the first time I had had to get moved for the terracing because there'd been a it was a wee bit of trouble. With, it was one hundred six thousand there, yeah. and we get moved onto the the gravel and my dad's shoulders. Um, it was a wee bit worrying and all the rest of it, but it, it, it was fine. But as a wee young lad, um, to see players like Big Billy scored that day, Lou McCarry scored that day, Dixie Dean scored that day, and it was just phenomenal. And it's always stuck in my mind that um, you know how good. Celtic were I mean I'm too I'm 56 I'm too uh, young for the 67 days but yeah. five years later um, Jock's rebuilding a team a, a, a lot of the Lisbon lines have moved on some of them are still there that was Jim Craig's last game I, I, I'm pretty sure um, but that showed that Celtic were rebuilding and, yeah. and they were becoming great again and Dixie Deans and, which is why the, the thing about people ask about favourite players and it's dead difficult about because there's so many generations there's so many decades but in terms of that as a young kid Dixie Deans was my favourite yeah. he, was, he was just and, phenomenal and see, uh, more, more, and more, so, more, sorry Alan I, I do need to make this point because it's good that I've ma mentioned Dixie Deans because yeah. obviously Alan's embarrassed there when I've mentioned Dixie um because he let six in again. <laughs> <laughs> he, let, he, let, he let six in again, Dixie. <coughs> and Tam, Tam will be angry because we did steal um, Dixie for, for Motherwell for aye, 17, aye. Of, was a four 17 and a half five. thousand quid, <laughs> which was, was no bad, but uh, Motherwell... also stole Andy Walker, <laughs> <laughs> Motherwell stole him for Nielsen for 100 quid, so they, 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 they shouldn't have gone the moral high horse or anything like that. <laughs> but he made so many records, yep. um, seven hat-tricks, um, the first guy post-war he scored six goals in one game McGrory mm -hmm. had scored eight uh, but that was way back in 1928 um, so from that point of view he was just absolutely magnificent but what really stuck in my mind was this game took place roughly I think about three weeks after the Inter Milan game Yes, when when the first time any European ties decided be penalties at Parkhead, we've held them at San Siro, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, we've held them in Milan, uh, no no, played them at Parkhead, no no, goes to penalties, and he's the first one up. Yeah, and he misses, mm -hmm. and uh, remarkably, I don't, you'll probably know this, but remarkably, no the other else. nine were, were all scored, and yeah. Murdoch had to take the the, the last one because it was something to do with regulations. Even though they were already through, he still had to take the penalty. Um, but three weeks later, and by the way, he's a sub that night, yeah. So he wasn't even in the starting eleven. Big Jock puts him into the team against Hibs in the cup final, and he repays that faith. And from my point of view, thinking about it and reflecting on it. It's a wee bit like an Eric Cantona moment because, you, you again, you'll probably be aware of this, but when Jock signed him in 71, he couldn't play for six weeks because he was banned, because he'd been banned at Motherwell. He'd been sent off seven times at Motherwell. So he had a terrible, terrible disciplinary record. Uh, Motherwell, I think, were quite happy to 
offload him because he, he was just banned all the time, wasn't able to play, although he scored a lot of goals for Motherwell. But when he came to Parkhead, big jock, took him under the wing and he only ever got sent off once in a reserve game after that. Yeah. yeah. So but he's disciplined. If, if, if the modern day players, the way they are, the physique, the, the way they look and everything, when they look at Dixie in that game, he was just a wee guy. Yeah. There was no build to him whatsoever. There was no like, no six pack or anything no. like that. It was just somebody like with bag, like bags of ability. Yeah. You know? And I don't know if six pastures. <coughs> six, uh, six. Oh. Yeah. Apparently, there's a story, Ruff, you can uh, confirm it, but there's a story that I. Ruffy was trying to wind them up at a corner. That's the uh, and he'd only, he'd five only scored five at this time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Ruffy's apparently says, When have you scored? Is it four or five? And <laughs> Dixie never answered them. And Paul comes in, he scores his six and he shoots six. Oh. <laughs> I, I don't know whether that's true, Ruffy, <laughs> but he, uh, Dixie told me. Stonewall. You were maybe just distracted. Stonewall. You were maybe just distracted. You were maybe just distracted by his initials. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I'm going to say this to you. You won't have grasped this, mm -hmm. but you're going to grasp it in this podcast. You obviously are not aware of the fact that. Tommy mm -hmm. is a former politician. They used to go in and deal with people who were there to try and absolutely annihilate them in an interview. So when you tried to butt in there well, twice, no, chance, no, 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 no chance because I just watched Tommy go into <laughs> politics mode. Bang, I'm finishing my right, point. Right. Bang, I'm going to finish my Be point. Shut up, right. Ruffy, till I get the Dixie Before we move away from Dixie, my favourite Dixie winner, I'll try and cut this short because it... it, it could go on quite long. He just came back from Australia and I used to go in on a Friday morning and, and train with Donny McKinnon. Yeah. Just me and Donny, we were the only two full time. And I walked into the dressing room and Donny said, You're not going to believe who we've signed. And I went, Who? He went, Dixie Deans. I said, You're kidding me on. He says, Dixie Deans is one of the best finishers I've ever seen. I've never seen anybody, you know, scoring goals like him. So Dixie comes <laughs> into the dressing room and I says to him, I said, oh, Big Donny thinks you're magnificent. He thinks you're the best finisher he's ever seen. All right, okay. So Donny says to me, we're going to go on the park. Uh, you go in the goals. I'll have 20 boys behind the goal and I'll just feed it out to Dixie and Dixie will just come in and finish. You no, know, one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> the first ball got laid back, Dixie kicked it, it ended up in Fur Hill Road. <laughs> the next one he tripped out of the ball. <laughs> he never had a goal at any stage of the twenty ball. And Donnie's going, God, it looks a bad sign in here. <laughs> you know, but Dixie was at it. Dixie was just taking the absolute Because of course it, after scoring the hat trick in the 72 Scottish Cup final he then scores a hat-trick in the 74 League Cup final. Yes. Again, Tibbs again. Yes. I mean yeah. and by the way, a week before that he scored the hat trick against Hibs in a league game, yeah. so he was known as the Hammer of Hibs. Um, but but he was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Former phenomenal. former Hibs player who scored the goal for Hibs in the six one game. I'll take a guess at uh, Jimmy Rook. No, nope. right, okay. Uh, uh, let's move on. You, you, Alan, Alan Gordon. Gordon. Alan Gordon. Who, Alan Gordon. Gordon. Talk, twelfth, talk twelfth minute. minute. Who scored the hat trick for Hibs in the six three game? Oh, that's easy. For Hibs. Hibs in the six three league cup game that he's talking about. No, I don't. I don't. His remember. first name was Joe. Baker. Oh my God. <laughs> Harper. You are the He's Harper. the best. Harper. Tom, he's the best. Harper. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, Harper. Honestly, he was How bad did he feel that night? He's got the hat trick and a sure. final and still gave me. I still remember three. Dixie turning and Jim Herry outside oh. in. Ah, it was unbelievable. One of the goals. Uh, now, it's <laughs> the second goal. That was the one he'd done the wee walkies <laughs> for. He was famous for and then he'd done it in 74. Right. He did his dokey. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, just dead one final wee Dixie story. The reason I'm so affectionate. 2011, I happen to find myself at Her Majesty's Pleasure in Berlin and Dixie comes in with, um, it was a project with the community and the prison and the rest of it, we're all gathered in the hall, Dixie getting brought in and it made my day because he says, it's Tommy Sheridan here. And I tell you, I was like, oh, man, brilliant. It was just, it was a lovely thing for him today. Went up, shook his hand, had a great chat with him. And since then, I've spoke to him several times after, including at my birthday and, uh, recently. Um, so uh, he's a fantastic guy, lovely guy. Uh, he's an ambassador up at Celtic Park now. And we should all learn for, um, for, for Dixie in terms of that point about missing the penalty. Three weeks before a big game, you miss the penalty. Everybody, he, he was he was dead worried. The fans would never forgive him because I mean, it was semi final, yeah. European Cup. And how bad does that make us all feel? Because the same night Rangers were playing in the semi final European Cup Winners Cup. Yeah. I mean, when when will that ever happen? Two Scottish teams semi finals at uh, European competitions. Uh, hope, hopefully, it will happen again. But who who knows? But he came back 
Brilliant confidence. Yeah. And he showed uh, on the park just how to recover. Who'd have thought, Tommy? We've got, we've got Berlin in here as well. We've got Dixie Deans. What a podcast this exactly, is. Exactly. I'd happily move on to some football we played in colour now, if you don't <laughs> mind. <laughs> I was about three when all this was happening. I know, idea I know, what I you're know. talking I thought, about. But I know well, so many take, games I'll take, take you forward to 1980 then, because oh, in terms of memorable go. games. Yes. Right. Scottish Cup final. Scottish Cup final. Uh, go with my pal Paul. Um, we are hopeful. Um, we, we, we get to, to Hamden that day. And to be fair, it wasn't the best of games. No, it wasn't right. the best of games. There was a lot of good chances for each uh, team. Big DJ, I, 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 I need to see Big DJ because I've, I've watched the highlights recently and a couple of <laughs> misses. Big DJ yeah. made nigga. could have finished it. Well, see, interestingly, tell me that. I, 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 my only memory of that is of what happened after the game and the horses on the pitch. I, I don't even know how the game went. What was well, the score? What, what, it was nothing each after full time. Went right. extra time. Right. Uh, and the truth is, it was heading for penalties because. Both sets of players were getting tired, although my good wee pal Frank McGarvey, I think you, you spoke to Frank recently, I mean, uh, when I watched the highlights recently, he's still running <laughs> the extra time, yeah, he's still yeah. going down the wing, taking on big Colin Jackson and all that, brilliant. Uh, in fact, Frank, his run down the wing, won the corner that led to the clearance, which led to Danny McGrain's volley, oh. the, the one and only Danny, volleys it. It could have been going on target, but big Peter McCloy had it covered. <laughs> and George McCluskey sticks out his leg. I remember that right now. And we went crazy, because the truth is, we, we didn't think we were going to win. Absolutely brilliant. And my memory of it, Tam... Um, it's a right shame you couldn't talk about all of this when you were looking for votes and you were a, <laughs> and you, and, and you were a Pollock fan. Well, but in, 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 in those days, I loved, Dave, I loved Davy Proven. Right. Davy was he was a fantastic player yeah. in, in those days and and no so well if he was here I knew I would maybe have a go at my his newspapers but anyway so D Davy Proven uh, <laughs> like um, in those days and I was a wee boy well I'm saying a wee boy I was 15, 16 when I, um, and I wanted to give my scarf so once the game's final whistle players have ran towards the Celtic end and I'm like my mate come on oh. And I jumped, jumped to her onto the gravel. Of course, one of the Rangers fans started running towards us. And the way I remember it was, we were all the wee boys. And we were like, oh, we were trying to get off the park. But of course, all the bears, <laughs> they're all like, oh, here's a fight. And, and as we're trying to get out, they're trying to go on. And if you look at it in the telly, you'll see it's like a seesaw. It goes yeah. one way and the other way and that way. And that's what it was like. And... And it Unfortunately only, it became a riot It only finished that riot when Tommy Brought his mother into the centre circle And <laughs> said that sing. was a song <laughs> <laughs> And they all yeah, trotted there's, back there's, 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 there's yeah. one And she's scene, still singing There's one scene that, that, that <laughs> really Irks me Selick fans that day And it was the, the, the singing see The PC on the horse <laughs> The big white horse <laughs> The big uh, baton oh, And it was a wee bit yeah. reminiscent of Pictures you see in a lot of households <laughs> You'll not know, you'll not know this what? It was John McKelvey and that white horse <laughs> 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 to be fair, actually, it's, 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 a, it's amazing how the you know the repercussions of that are still felt today, isn't it? You, can, you can't you can't get drinking games. You can if you go to rugby matches. Ruffy and he's he's better half can sit at Murrayfield and have a glass of wine. Absolutely, no problem. But for the working class people, Tommy, can do you can't get That's a drink. That's what I meant. That. I wasn't being facetious the other week on. Um, this broken up. Oh, fuck it, right? Where it is? Well, I managed to remember no to say when my birthday was. Right, but yeah. He's letting it say. I know, I know. I'm selling knots here. Peter, <laughs> Peter's got it in his mind at Fort Gordon listening to this podcast a century ago now. But I know, right? So shut up. All I was going to say was that if we do bring back the drink and everything, saying, oh, what if we get trouble again? Then the very fact that it was the Celtic and Rangers fans who got it stopped in 1980, then let's try to reintroduce it. Apart from the Celtic and the Rangers fans, yeah. or apart from Parky well, and well, I, well, let's ask see him. how we go no, on. Let's ask Tommy. How I can, don't think you need any. You, how can you? How can you, as a politician, bring into effect a law that is for one group of people, but the other <clears throat> another set of people can get away with it? How can you bring a law in that should be governing all, but suddenly a blind eye is turned to one group of people? But but it doesn't. That, that law doesn't govern everyone. Peter, no, we know you, that because you know if you're wealthy or well connected, then you can go into the, um, the hospitality suites during the games, and you can you can drink alcohol. Yeah, um, right. so, so it's no banned. The idea of banning cans, bottles, and all the rest of it 
from during the game. I mean, I, I'm not going to make an apology for it. I think it should be banned. Yeah. I, I, it's sport, for Christ's sake. Why, why should you be encouraging people to be drinking during a game and all the rest of it? I mean, if, if, if people can't go to a football game and enjoy 90 minutes without 90 a drink, minutes. for yeah. God's sake, come on. There's yeah. plenty of time before a game or after a game to go for a drink. Oh, so oh, hold, hold on, man. Here's, the, here's a line for you then. Right. Here's a line. It's not Be the careful Here's it, a line it, right, it's not exactly. the, <laughs> There we are We talked about Millennium I'm going to Here's a line <laughs> the, 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 the point I'm going to make To you is That it's an entertainment it, It's an entertainment So I could go to America And sit And watch a football game Enter Miami I'll have a beer You can go to a West End musical You can have a beer It's not the drinking It's the education of people Not to overindulge in it but and not that, conduct no, themselves. I'm not sure that is the case because I, I, well, remember, that is the case. Well, I remember going down to London a couple of years ago watching Shrek the musical. But all the drinks you had to you had to have the drink and leave it outside. You're only allowed to take a drink in to actually watch the the production. Well, I, I, I go. I go. You might I, have been, I, yeah, you might have been. I've been I've no, two years ago. I watched when Billy I was Joel and I had a pint of London, lager. As long as you put it in um, a plastic tumbler. Yeah. And I'm sure any football fans that want to go and be able to just enjoy a beer, nobody's talking about folk being able to get triple brandies and just keep ordering <laughs> them up and sitting there and a guy out way. Well, I okay. <laughs> might have just it. Because well, you see, once you say that, right? I know, I know, I know. Uh, you, and then you, what if? Well, the problem a, with laws. Is if you set a law, yeah. you then have to have a stop know, and a start. You can't have the variation. And, and see for guys, then, the I've guy that interprets going to get a doing. You see know, for guys I've heard saying, "I but all we're wanting is like a beer, a, you know, a beer in a plastic tumbler." Now the minute you say, "Right, okay, we're allowing that," what if the guy two seats down he says, "You know what? If there's one thing I hate, it's beer. Can I please have a brandy? Yeah. Can I please?" And no, you can't have that. Well, you know, then you get into a muddle. I agree with Tommy actually, generally. As much as I think, ah, it'd be great smashing if you could get a wee drink at the football. But I think folk, in the same way that I, I feel exactly the same way folk can go to the pictures and see a film without throwing down like a bloody three course meal and big crunchy nachos and all that. Yeah. Why can they not shut up? And, and they don't open them film? until with bloody film exactly. started, which exactly. is a pain in the ass. The only food on sale, I've said it for years at a picture, should mm. be bananas. Ruffy, <laughs> remind me no no to go to the pictures with Tam. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like yeah, hanging yeah, dance. I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the the bags of popcorn are getting bigger by the minute. Oh, yeah. It's getting ridiculous now. But, but getting... be, before we leave the football, because <laughs> uh, memorable games as well. Because same year, again going back and thinking about games you're at that make you think, oh, God, how good a team we were. Real Madrid came to Parkhead, nineteen eighty yep. quarter final European Cup. Laurie Cunningham's first game. Yep. Absolutely. Superb player. Fantastic. We were watching the warm up and thinking, oh, shit. Is that the year they get through to play Gretna in the final? <laughs> 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 and then that, that particular night, uh -huh. that particular night, which what was fantastic, some of you will remember, you'll remember Alan Sneddon, right? The Alan didn't get maybe as much credit as I think he was due. He was a, an honest, hard working player, wasn't the most glamorous of players, or whatever. He actually made two goals that night. He, he, he had yeah. the shot that led to George McCluskey's goal, yeah. and then he had the cross for Johnny Doyle. He hit the end two 0 Real Madrid, absolutely brilliant. With a goal disallowed that night that could have been crucial because, yeah. of course, we went away to Bern the Bow and get beat three 0 in the in the return leg, which was disappointing. Yeah. Get, these are like memories in your your head, and you think to yourself, "That's where Scottish football was." We were up there competing aye, aye. at the top level. Mm. What the hell happened? What well, the hell well, happened? Well, to be to be fair, that was for a long, long time the last time Celtic had ever been in the latter stages. Although, dare I say it, if you look back the history books, they only had to beat two mediocre sides to get to the quarterfinal. Uh, they got to the quarterfinal and then for a good long time, they didn't get anywhere near um, the, the knockout stages of any European tournament. But that was the time when Scottish football was changing, Tam. Yes. Aberdeen and Dundee United yep. were starting to take control power. and they were becoming the power in the game. So uh, I, I just think it was a joy at times to actually go and watch teams. I mean, Rangers and Celtic were going down the way. I think what you're saying, Peter, that was the days when Aberdeen and Dundee United were getting to European know, last stages of tournament. Finals, Scottish football was... I remember watching a documentary and it was the um, Barcelona guys uh, for, for, for Rangers oh, sitting around talking about the achievement. And the, the, the thing they said about beating Bayern Munich was they said at Bayern Munich, uh, they get a 1-1 draw 
and he said, ah, by the end of the game, they were knackered. We we were running over the tap with them. And when they came to Ibrox, we, we pummeled them. We won 2-0. Yeah. We were superior fitness. Now, how many times do you sit and watch games in the telly now and you think, oh, the Europeans, they look a lot fitter than us. You look a lot stronger than us. Yeah. What is it that we've done wrong? How, right. how are we part now? But, but, but with all due respect to, to the 1972 Rangers side, they had a lot of technically gifted players. Rangers, Derek Johnson could play three positions. Derek Johnson could play centre forward, centre mid, or centre half. That's how good he was. You know, you had Sandy Jarden in that side. You had Greggy, who some people think was a clogger. He was actually a very good player. You had Alfie Conn, gifted footballer, went on to play for Spurs. Tommy McLean. And Tommy, uh, and he played for Celtic. Tommy McLean was a really good player. Willie Johnson was a really talented player, Ruffy. You played alongside him. He was a, I mean, he was a gifted winger as well. They'd, and Derek Parlin was a young boy who came in to the side to help them get to the final because he actually scored against them. Um, and he was a he was a good player. So there are a lot of good yeah, players. Was there, no, was there no year as well that Kamarnock were there as well? Semi finals. I'm not sure. Are you going back to the sixties? Yeah, no, but yeah. it was Celtic. He's with in, Kamarnock, he's, Rangers, he's in Celtic. 72. But yeah. I mean, once you get to the eighties, once you get to the eighties, you've got Celtic rebuilding. You've got Aberdeen and Dundee United stronger, and you've got Rangers in a downward spiral. Tam, because they started signing players that, with all due respect to them, were not Rangers class, and that's what prompted eventually. You know, uh, Lawrence Marlborough, uh, the big, the big money, the change in Scottish football again to try and redress the balance of the game. Um, listen, there's lots of things that I could talk to you about. Is, is that your all-time favourite game, Real Madrid? No, no. I, th- I think my all-time favourite game's going to be the six-one. Six-one, yeah. He just made so many uh, records. And is Dixie your favourite player of that of that era? I would say, yeah. I mentioned David Proven uh, as well. I think of the current era, mm. somebody who effectively has got history in the making it's got to be Bruni he's he's just been an absolute mainstay of that team now 13 years he's now I I was checking up some statistics there and and I was noticing that the only three players that played in all nine of the first nine in a row was McNeil well actually there's a good one for you who are the three players that have played in all all of the nine titles the first nine in a row Okay, um, I think we've got to go Bobby Lennox, um, Billy McNeil. You've just said, and the third one who would have played all the way through from sixty-five. Um, John Clark? Hey, uh, no, not John. I don't think it's John Clark. No, I think he'd gone by then. So Simpson, Craig, and Gemma, Murdoch, McNeil, Clark, Johnston, Wallace. Uh, oh, Jimmy left in seventy-five. Yeah, Johnson, Jimmy Johnson. There you go. That, yep. but who? Of the current squad is going to because nine's in the back. We're going to win nine, but who, who's who's the current squad that were there for the the nine? For the nine, how many? How many? How many? Two. Two. So Scott Brown, you've said. I know. I've yeah, Scott Scott Brown and one other person that's been there for the nine. Oh, Forrest. Uh, Forrest. Well done, James Tam. Forrest. Forrest. Well done, now, Tam. The point about yeah. Bruni is he's now walking in the footsteps of legends like Billy McNeil in terms yeah. of captain for the nine. Yeah. But he's got the chance to do the ten. Yeah, do you know what? it's never been done. <coughs> that, you, so. Well, well, chance to do the chance to do the ten consecutively. There, yes, there consecutively. Is a, can That's you name a Scottish mean. footballer who's got ten. That's got ten titles. Got ten, t- um, t- ten league titles. Ten league titles, and he won nine of them in a row. And he's got ten. Well, Bruni's Bruni's actually got uh, about eleven, I think. So that's one. But um, you're saying consecutively in a row. Somebody no, somebody won. <clears throat> somebody won nine in a row, but also won a Premier League medal with someone else. So you get ten medals. Right. He's okay. got ten Premier League medals. You know that, Ruffy? Scottish yeah. Premier League medals. Scottish Premier League medals. He won. He was part of a nine in a row side, and he also won another one. And did they pay their taxes? They were all, the, they were the, all the there. Name. It was all Alfie there. Alfie Coin. Eh? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, but mixed up with the question. <laughs> well, well, it's, it's, it's a player. Trying to somebody to be the best Celtic uh, Rangers, yeah, basically. Well, it's a player who was part of the nine in a row for Rangers. Yes. And, oh. and, he, and he won a medal elsewhere. Uh, in Scotland? In Scotland, yeah. So, I'll, g- I'll give you his name. Give no. his initials first. Yeah, I'll, oh, I can't. Give his first initial. I can't give you his. That gives it away as well. I mean, it's so obvious. Yeah, his middle name. Yeah, eh? his middle name. Frederick. Frederick. Yeah. So, <laughs> right, so he was part of the nine in a row at Rangers. Yes, and he won a Premier he won a League Scottish medal. Scottish top flight title elsewhere. Elsewhere. 
Uh, that would have been... Uh-huh. Had to be somebody who went to Aberdeen. That would have been... Um, Get roughy. Eyes lighting up. No, I don't know. Go for it. We could be here all day. Richard Goff. Ah, who'd you get it with? Well, he got the Dundee United. United one originally. He won the. I see you two. Uh, 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 you actually confused that question. Because he had that one I, first, I then had the that nine. First. Yeah. yeah, But the way you said it was, he had the nine, and then he won another one. Listen, and listen. I'm thinking to myself, who else has won the league? Listen, how, nah. how many times have you been interviewed as a politician and you've got a straight <laughs> question right? It's ten. That was a curveball. That was, was a curveball. Richard Goff, ten. Uh, okay. um, so uh, apart from anything else, you mentioned your love of football. What inspired you for your love of politics? Well, um, I've got a lot of particular inspirations. One of them is a guy called John McLean that, that sadly no everybody in Scotland's heard of. Though I think he was in the um, the Bruce Willis uh, role uh, with Die Hard, unfortunately. But he was a fantastic revolutionary in between the First World War um, and uh, he led the rent strikes. He helped to lead industrial actions. Went to jail five times for opposing the carnage of the First World War. But he was born in Pollock Shaw, it's no far from where uh, I was brought up. And uh, when I started to discover him, age of 16, 17, I just found him totally and utterly inspiring. Uh, he wanted a workers report. Public. He wanted Scotland to have its uh, right to set its own laws and to join up with the rest of the world as an independent nation. He was a big, big inspiration for me. And then later on, more I learned about politics, uh, Peter probably, my biggest inspiration was Fidel. Um, Fidel Castro. Um, oh, it's, just, it's just Fidel. <laughs> Fidel. F- he, used to, he used to come over for, to fin- Poland fin- for dinner. Fantastic story. F- Fidel was uh, arrested way back in '54. He, he was involved in a movement called the July 26 movement. They tried to overthrow the military dictator there, Batista, in and, and, and Cuba. It was horrible times, and people were living in poverty. And, and he and others were trying to overthrow the, the, the guy because he was. Uh, Am I allowed to say bastard? I don't yeah, no, no, we'll, we'll, we'll let you away with it. He's a bastard. So um, he got arrested, put in jail, done his own defence. He wrote a fantastic pamphlet uh, during that time called History Will Absolve Me, which is a fantastic read. Anybody that's interested in politics, go and read it. Um, he got um, expelled to Mexico. Um, after he came out of jail, they expelled him to Mexico. And him and a group in 1956, 82 of them, got on a wee boat. Um, to sail from Mexico to Cuba to begin the Cuban Revolution, 82 of them. Unfortunately, the, vote, the boat was only big enough for about 20 of them, so uh, it was very, very uh, rickety. They got there late, they never met up with the other people they were supposed to meet up with. Uh, somebody grassed them up so that Batista's troops were waiting for them when they got onto the beach. A lot of them got killed, uh, immediately others had to scatter, and uh, after about a week, there was 12 of them left. And uh, F- Castro announced, we will now go and build the Cuban Revolution, 12 of them. And that was in December of 56. Two years later, marches into Havana and they've won the Cuban Revolution. So that for a guy who's got that type of spirit and that type of optimism has got to inspire and inspires me. Nay harm me, but Frank McGarvey tells us that story a few <laughs> weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> He's been reading my books again. He's been reading my books. Well, the one wee bit I took out of that, and I wonder if that inspired you, that but when you said that he defended himself, you, of course, famously uh, did that, and it was a third in command at the Daily Record got a cheque for £25 from a reader. You must know this story. The, when uh, Tommy decided to go alone um, in uh, court... Um, the Daily Record uh, ran with the headline Tommy Drops His Briefs yep. right? A famous headline <laughs> in a day And uh, an anonymous uh, 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 Reader Sent in a cheque for £25 Just sent 25 quid into Daily Record Said whoever came up with that headline Please uh, uh, tell him to get a pint On me and it was a boy You've met him since I'm sure at the time Bob Caldwell he was number three at the paper at the time, and uh, Bob got twenty five squiddly diddlies for yes. coming up with that headline. I so we inspired by, when when you were saying about Fidel Castro, uh, you know, uh, defending himself. Mm. Must have been a wee bit of that in the back of your head when you did it. I, I don't think so, Tam. I, I mean, John McLean defended himself as well. John McLean in nineteen eighteen, he got done for sedition for opposing the First World War. Bet Simonovic wishes he could do it. He made, <laughs> <laughs> he, made, he made one of his most famous uh, speeches. He said, I stand here not as the accused, but as the accuser of capitalism, dripping from head to toe with the blood of innocent uh, men. So he goes in there, high court, very intimidating. Any of you have ever been in court, you'll know it's built to be intimidating. 
and he's not intimidated at all. He just stands up, does his own defence. End up getting five years uh, in Peterhead. Um, never done the five years. He was he was released because of popular pressure uh, before the five years was up. But he was poisoned. His food was tampered with, and uh, and and Peterhead, and unfortunately died at the age of forty four, which was a tragic end to a, a guy's life who was a brilliant inspiration. So the whole idea of defending yourself sometimes comes for you know your own story better than anybody else and when you put your trust in somebody else to articulate your story you better hope that they actually have got some faith in you and that they've got the balls in the bottle to stone up to all the judges and all, all the frippery uh, that's meant to, to keep you doing and that's why I think a lot of people sometimes say bugger this I'm going to fight my own case. Yeah. Did you, did, you mentioned people who <clears throat> inspired you, and, and, and by, I don't know if you know this, but Ruffy, every time you were talking about anything historically, it was just dying to jump in and carry <laughs> you. No, I to, no, 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 I went to Cuba, and what I was going to say was, if you ever go into that museum, and you have to, come, you have to come out there, you, yeah, you have to come out with being impressed ah. by everything that went on. Uh, it's absolutely an amazing museum. Yeah. The, the boat that I've talked that about. The boat's the, there. The sail, it's in the museum. I mean, yeah. it's obviously, it's full of holes and all that. But the boat's there um, in the national newspaper that uh, the government launched. They call it the Grandma after the name of the boat. Um, yeah. So, listen, Cuba's history is remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. Pure inspiration. The fact that they're still there. Of yeah, Old Fidel, okay, died at 90, but he's seen off about six different American presidents, all of whom wanted them deep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's seen them off, and I, I just love the place. Well, they're from history. Is there is there a particular is there a particular politician that you liked that you thought uh, he's a class act from modern day that we would? I mean, I, I've only actually Tony Ben. Tony yeah, ben I've only I'm actually not, paid for one person to go and see, and I went to the Edinburgh Playhouse, an audience with Tony Ben. Oh, great, one chair, one man, and he walked onto the stage, Tam, and said, "I'll take." Any question from anywhere in the audience about any topic, let's start. Oh. And he answered everything. everything. American politics, giant intellect, Middle giant. Eastern politics. He would be able to tell you why there was skullduggery going on here, why there was arms deals there. He was unbelievable, Tom. Very proud of him. Um, very, very proud. He, he, he wrote to me when I was in prison in 92, sent me a lot of books, wrote to me when I was in prison in 2011. Um, sent me a cracking book uh, David Conn about uh, football uh, I had the pleasure of spending time with him doing his, his, his pad in Holland uh, Park uh, 146 Holland Park we, we, I remember one of the brilliant stories was I'm, I'm sitting um, discussing with, with Tony we're talking about independence because Tony was a British socialist yes. but he understood why people in Scotland wanted independence and, and he was not prepared to, he, he never attacked independence, not at all, he was very supportive of the things we were doing, but he, he, he shows me a chair that he's, he's got there that was Keir Hardy's original chair and then he says to me, no, Tommy, can you just tell me, is this four minutes or five minutes? He was making me a wee microwave meal. <laughs> and, and, he says, and he he comes out, he shows me, and it was so surreal, I'm sitting with this absolute giant, uh, inspiration in my life in his aspects <laughs> four or five minutes for this wee microwave meal it was a gem of a person yeah. beautiful the ironic, beautiful the person. ironic thing was you get Keir Hardy's chair at a warrant sale <laughs> 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 you're a bad man Tom <coughs> no I agree with you he was oh, Tony Burns, but he's one yeah. of the guys see this is where I, uh, uh, for time to time and I'll date because he's here as well Irrespective of people's politics, I like guys who are what I would just say are a good watch. Guys that are, you know, I don't care if you agree or disagree with stuff that Tommy's come out with in the past. But when Tommy was in Holyrood, you think, oh, I'm going to watch uh, First Minister's Questions. Tommy might come out with one. If you put on Question Time and George Galloway was on it, irrespective of what folk thought of George Galloway's politics, you think, go on, George, go for it, you know. Yeah. And you can still joy of joys with Tommy, with George. You could have done with the late Tony Benson, him on programmes like that. And that, for me, when it comes to even getting guests for your own show, that's what I always go with. You, I, would, I would sneer folk in, uh, uh, in all the years I've been doing the radio for example oh you had so and so in your show at one of them and I say look I didn't bother about that person's politics I'd have had Paul Pot on you know anybody Mussolini yeah. as long as he were a good guest maybe tell a couple of gags uh, and were able to get a story across and that, that, that's all you're yeah. looking for Although you, a couple you of George that. Galloway stories yeah I, I was going to say to you yeah. yeah. George and I we clash swords a lot on independence questions do you like him? George isn't for independence look 
I've been a friend of his for many, many years. We disagree on independence. I'm not going to... If somebody else is attacking him, I'm going to defend him. Yeah. If me and him are discussing, we're going to, uh, we're going to get heated on, on the question of independence because he's, uh, he's for the maintaining the union. But George tells the story um, of... I've been doing it to Faz Lane um, and there was obviously a big crowd days. I think it was 2000 or 2001. Um, hundreds of days and we're all sitting in a row we're refusing to allow the traffic in we're trying to, try to close down the base our ad- argument was that nuclear weapons had been declared illegal by the International Criminal Court therefore we were there to disarm um, the base and we weren't there allowing the, the traffic to go in so <laughs> we all got the warnings about moving and all the rest of it and eventually the police said right I'm going to move them and George swears that he, he heard <laughs> he heard one big inspector say listen I'll take Sheridan you take the Olgin <laughs> 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 he, he says he, he knows then that the, the flame, the torch of socialism was passing a new generation. Then many, many years after that, uh, 2008, I think it would have been, um, I'd been invited to get to the Big Brother House. I'd been invited to go in in 2007 and I'd knocked it back because I was still in the Parliament. And George went in in 2008 and I'd been invited again in 2009. Um, and George was in Scotland, he was doing some meeting and all that. Uh, I said, George, I'm going to make a wee meeting with you about Big Brother. What, 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 what do you think and all that? So we met uh, out at Mar House, actually. He was staying at Mar House and we met for breakfast one Saturday morning. And George says, Tommy, listen, when I was asked to do Big Brother, I, I had a plan. I knew what I was going to do. I was going to write a new book. Now, I knew you weren't getting pens and paper, but I was going to write it up here. He says, after the first three days... All I wanted to know is who stole the fucking hobnobs. (laughs) (laughs) In other words, he was was saying that it it plays with your mind. You think you're going to do the things and then it doesn't work. In two moments, you mentioned the house. The house is for his most embarrassing moment. The the car. I mean, that's... But his best moment... I never actually... I I wouldn't watch trash television, so thankfully I I didn't see his worst moment. But... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Life. 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 No, <laughs> we're not allowed to. We're not allowed to watch Big Brother and things like that, right? But, right. Yeah, yeah. but his best moment is in six parts. If you go on YouTube. Oh, his aye, best aye, moment aye. is in the US the Senate. Oh, he's brilliant. Oh, oh, yeah, that, that he was finest hour. He tears finest them. hour. Tears them to shreds. And yeah. the best bit of that is the faces of the folks sitting around about him who have clearly never heard <laughs> anybody answering <laughs> back. If you like what I said, they Absolutely. were like, oh, that's what, riveting telling. Why are you asking me where he got his weapons? It was you that sold them. You'll have the receipts. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, talking um, of receipts, one that I remember with George after, uh, there was a couple of things with George. I mean, first up, I salute what I'm saying about guys with an intellect, and you get them in your shows, it's absolutely brilliant. George uh, took over our show one day. Somebody happened to mention bees. Have I mentioned this to you no, before, Peter? No. No, somebody happened to mention bees. When we're sitting here talking about whatever, Wraith Rovers, Motherwell, Celtic, St. Johnson, somebody mentioned bees. And George, and you'll know exactly what I mean by this, Tommy, George just went into this like 12-minute monologue about bees and the part they play in the planet and for all our survival and what we should do to protect them and where they're most at danger and what we can do to make sure they're not at danger. And it was honestly, it was about 11 or 12 minutes and... Everybody in the whole building was just talking about it. Everybody about George Galloway there with the bees, you know, it was, it was absolutely uh, uh, amazing. But the other thing about George that I'll never forget was the it, it was clearly post 2006 then, and uh, we'd had him back on our show, it might even be the same show, in fact. And a couple of weeks later, I think uh, we were either going out to somewhere like Tenerife or coming back. In the taxi, uh, anyhow, and a guy who was a taxi driver at Glasgow Airport told me the story. He said that George had arrived uh, off a plane, picked up at Glasgow Airport with this same driver, and George pulled out this cigar. It was almost like a baseball bat, you know, and uh, the boy clocked him right away. It's post-2006, smoking ban, can he smoke at this guy's place of work in the taxi, da-da-da. And the guy goes, oh, George, George, off he, sorry, mate, you can't, he was just about to light it. You can't, you can't light that, George, you know. And George rather, you know, uh, just the, the look that he says that he gave the guy, and he says, uh, do you know who gave me this cigar? <laughs> Fidel Castro, you know, and the driver says he, he picked up his packet of 10 Regal and he said, Do you know who gave me these? Agnes and RS McCall's. I can't smoke either. Put it fucking up. 
Brilliant. And he just brought him right down. But I can imagine it would have been Castro giving him that uh, yep. cigar. Yep. Yeah. 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 I was going to ask Tom, what do you think the biggest change is in politics <laughs> were way back then to now? Well, I would. Oh, sorry, that Tom. <laughs> Alan, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that there is a a massive change. I think the social media uh, has probably um, opened up more ridicule, um, maybe more participation. I mean, social media is like. uh, it's like a knife in it it can be used for a useful purpose and it can be used for a destructive purpose and um, it, it probably means that um, that politicians don't feel as uh, free to say things at meetings in case oh somebody's videoing it and uh, goes out and they oh they shouldn't have said that that was off the record no, nothing's off the record now that type of thing um, but at the end of the day Alan if, if you're at a meeting and you're saying something political and you don't want it to be reported don't say it I mean if you, if you don't believe it don't don't say it. What pisses me off is what what I love about uh, George, Tony, um, few others, Bob Crow is another big guy, guy that I love, the leader of the RMT. Uh, sadly, Bob and uh, Tony both both died this this month, I think. I'm, gonna, I'm allowed to say March now. But anyway, yeah. we're, we're in March and both of them died in, in, in March in, in a week between each other, which was very, very sad. Big loss to the socialist movement. And what I loved was they didn't need notes. They, they, you, you look at a lot of these politicians in Parliament now, and all you need to do is be able to read, because all they do is read things. And I, I had the debates with some people, and I'm thinking to myself, listen, see if you don't know what your brief is, see if you don't know what you're going to say. For God, how are you going to convince other people yeah. that you believe in something? I, I remember going to one debate during the 2014 referendum campaign, and I'm debating with this guy, he's in Edinburgh, he's packed all his students, and he read for notes, and I thought, guys, you know, come on, you, you've done a lot of meetings, you must know what you're going to say, he was an MSP. But the thing that got me was when we came to the summations. He notes for his summation. Uh, and I'm uh, saying to myself, the summation should be you summating what's been said at the meeting. No bloody notes. Yeah. And I, that gets me sometimes, Alan, that I think your politics has to be in here and then you articulate it. The best politicians are people who can articulate what's in there. But far too many of them are phony, they're plastic. Um, you look at the... Who's the worst in the go there now? Who's oh. the one that makes you sick when you turn on the telly? <laughs> I, I, I despise names. Johnson. I, I, I just despise him. I, I think he's a complete and utter phony, a, a buffoon, a, a racist, a misogynist, a liar. I think he's everything that politics shouldn't be about. But unfortunately, I don't understand why. But in England, he's getting support, Tam. And probably that election of last year, 2019, December, probably for anybody that had any doubt that Scotland's a different country for England, that election showed right. it. Oh, yeah. Because <coughs> in Scotland he get gubbed, absolutely gubbed. And who's the one that I mean, who's the one that could shock as well? Some that politically would be poles apart, but you'd have been happy sitting down having a cup of coffee and a wee scone with them. Oh goodness, that's just because you maybe one. respect, mm. even though you've got different ideals, you respect them. Jesus, that is a difficult one. Um, do you know? It's probably not a politician. This may be a cop. I'm sorry, I'm going to cop it here. But I love Donald Finlay. I love Donald uh, to bits. I think he's a man of great integrity, great intellect, lovely uh, character about him, a lot misunderstood, and yet what it pulls apart, because politically he's a Tory, he's also a big Rangers man and all the rest of it, but I I, I consider him a friend and and, uh, I enjoy his company. So there's... well. Don't enjoy his coming that much. I want to employ him again. But anyway, the 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 the, the point <laughs> any, is any the, news in there? Uh, <laughs> no, you're right. <laughs> but, uh, from from the point of view, there was an old there was a here's one wee story. And uh, most viewers, uh, unless they're of a particular age, won't remember this guy. A guy called John Young. Uh, he was a Tory council leader in Glasgow, and I was elected away back in 1992. I was elected for prison uh, in 1992. Took up my seat, um, and I was. Quite persona non grata we or a Labour mob and all that. They hated us because I'd taken a lot of votes that used to go to the Labour Party and I'd taken them. So I, I was quite persona non grata. Um, I, I was elected there. And this wee guy, a uh, wee bald headed guy, immaculately dressed, and he went out his way to um, come up and talk to me and offer advice and, and talk about the admin, how the council works and all the rest of it. And from then on in, I was very friendly with him. 
absolutely loggerheads with debates with him, but I respected him, Tam, because I knew what he was, he knew what I was, and there was no problem. Aye. The problem with Blair and everything <clears throat> that he brought in, in my opinion, they're Tories. So they don't have integrity, they don't have the ability to say, I know who they are. During that era, that Blair era, you needed the wee bit at the bottom of the telly to tell you what party they were in. Because they talked the same as the Tories, they said the same as the Tories, they looked the same as the Tories. You couldn't tell any difference. Yeah. Um, listen, I know you, you you don't want anybody who read, reads notes. Uh, can you tell me <laughs> anything that you uh, <laughs> that you inspired you from the, the point of view of somebody who, you know, maybe uttered a line that sticks with you and resonates with you through time? I mean, I, I, I look, I, I was a big I like the speeches of John F. Kennedy. You know, we have come too far to disdain the future now. Is there is there a line that you like that somebody delivered? It could have been a Tony Benn that just sticks in your mind. T Tony always talked about never be guided by fear, always be guided by hope, and and I think that's a, a beautiful inspirational line for your life as as a whole. Never be guided by fear, always be guided by hope. Mandela said something very very similar. John McLean, the one, the one that, I mean, beautiful speeches, loads and loads of beautiful speeches, but I remember him talking about socialism, and for a lot of people, socialism's about, oh, everybody's the same, and it's all grey, and, and McLean used to say, we're out for socialism, we're out for life, and all that life has to offer, and it's great technicolor. And the point he was making was, socialism wasn't about levelling down, Socialism was about levelling up. It was about giving everybody a decent standard and quality of life. It wasn't about saying people who have got a nice house and a nice car, oh, you're going to take your house off, you're going to take your car off. It was about saying to people, listen, why can everybody not have a decent standard of life? It's not as if we live in a poor country, we a poor society. We live in a very, very rich society. Yeah. There's more than enough to give everybody a decent standard of life. And that gold, gold <coughs> will bring you happiness when you're growing old. Sydney? Dean Martin. Dean Martin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That line that you right, just yeah. mentioned there, it, it, it progresses and it takes on many <laughs> forums. You know, it's like John Prescott, he embarrassed that you've got two Jaguars and he says, no, I believe everybody should have two Jaguars. My favourite quote was obviously Jock Steen in it, huh? Cardiff at half time. Get on you fat bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Ruffy is a brilliant line, but Bill Shankly, in terms of keeping yep. to, to your link. Yeah. Um, socialism is where everyone works hard and everybody shares in the rewards. It's the way I see football. It's the way I see life. There you go. It's the perfect way to finish. I've enjoyed it. Um, I think we've managed to stay on side as well. Thoroughly enjoyed uh, the trip down memory lane for some of uh, Tommy Sheridan's great football memories as well as, of course, a, a career in politics. Uh, thanks to Ruffy. Thanks to Tam Cowan and, of course, Tommy Sheridan. You can uh, join us on the podcast every week on Spotify, Libsyn, Deezer. Uh, and, of course, you can also watch uh, the podcast on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel as well. Tommy, it's been a joy. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much.